Hello there. Thanks for joining us on another edition of Jamaica Magazine. We're on the cusp of independence. That's right. Tomorrow we celebrate 57 years of nationhood, 57 years of advancements, and 57 years of development. We've come a far way and continue to make strides in becoming the place of choice to live, work, raise families, do business, and as the Prime Minister adds, retire in paradise. We have a word of advice, followed by the news. Stay with us. This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spreads the Zika, chikungunya, and dengue viruses. Search for its breeding sites and destroy them. A message from the Ministry of Health. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, August 5. July has recorded its highest ever arrival figures with the Tourism Ministry estimating 250,584 visitors for the summer month. This now means the island has welcomed nearly 2 million visitors from January 1 to July 31 and has earned over $2 billion. Portfolio Minister Edmund Bartlett says these are phenomenal numbers, which have been the result of impressive progress over the past five years. So far this year, the country has recorded an increase in arrivals of 132,980 visitors, almost doubling the performance from last year. Meanwhile, earnings as projected is 8.4% higher than last year. Minister Bartlett says this performance places Jamaica in a good place with the industry globally and outpaces the ministry's projections. The Jamaica Constabulary Force has provided eight buses to safely transport rank-and-file police officers to and from work. Commissioner of Police Major General Anthony Anderson officially handed over the buses to the Jamaica Police Federation at his office on Old Hope Road last Friday. He says it's part of a broader welfare program that the force has been rolling out for policemen and women. This came out of an incident that happened a few years ago where one of our members got killed uh, whilst off duty. And it was felt that providing this service would provide that um, sense of security for our police officers. It's really important as they protect the society that they also when they're off duty are protected. Chairman of the Police Federation, Sergeant Petre Rowe, welcomed the buses, which will be going to the police divisions of Area 1, 4 and 5. Certainly the Police Federation hopes that in due time, we will have a broader fleet of buses to service the entire island but we must indicate that this is a good start. The fleet of buses will be managed by the Police Federation's Central Executive, which has established routes and developed standard operating procedures for the vehicles. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang has lauded the security forces for their interception of 2,700 pounds of cocaine southeast of Morant Point in St. Thomas last week. The drug has an estimated value of over 35.7 million U.S. dollars or 4.9 billion Jamaican dollars. Dr. Chang says the transshipment is part of the guns and food for drug trades. He says intelligence has confirmed that about 200 guns enter the island on a monthly basis, which represents a clear and present danger that must be addressed with clearly defined strategies. And who we need to catch is not the man who them used to shoot people, it's the man who's organizing this. Now what this sends us is not just that commend the improved capacity of the JDF or Coast Guard, but it tells us that operating around Jamaica now is people who have the capacity to deal with 3,000 pounds of coke. That is a serious business enterprise. Dr. Chang was closing the sectoral debate in the House of Representatives last Wednesday. Also coming out of Parliament, Minister Carl Samuda has announced that students who underperformed in the first sitting of the primary exit profile, PEP, will benefit from interventions in Grade 7. Upon entering high school, the students on pathway two and three, which is the areas of greatest concern to us, are assigned to pathway coaches in literacy, mathematics, depending on what the assessment reveals. The Minister with Oversight for the Education Portfolio says that approximately 34% of the students who sat PEP this year were proficient or highly proficient in all subjects. Meanwhile, close to 50% showed limited or no evidence of the required competence. 
students on pathway three, which is the pathway that is in gravest need, will undergo psychoeducational assessments to determine their ability levels in various areas of cognition, as well as their achievement levels in all areas of literacy and numeracy. Information from this assessment will be used by the coaches to develop individual intervention plans which will be used to guide their instruction. Minister Samuda adds that by September there will be close to 100 math coaches across all regions and 20 literacy specialists to improve students' academic performance. In the meantime, the Education Ministry has spent $817 million purchasing textbooks, electronic aids and other supplies for grades 1 to 13 for the upcoming academic year. Distribution of the resources begins this month and will support the national standards curriculum and other curricula across the sector. And the inventory taken of books that were stored in storerooms across the country have been identified and reallocated so that it reduces the demand for books that we've had to buy. And finally, the Jamaica Fire Brigade, JFB, has received 33 computers from the Met Service to support the establishment of a bushfire warning index. The computers were bought at a cost of $4.18 million with funding from the ACP EU Caribbean Development Bank's Natural Disaster Risk Management Program. The warning index will track, manage and record bushfires and hopefully prevent the destruction of forests and farms across the country. The computers will have special software that will allow for the effective database management and will also be supported with the global positioning system GPS units that will assist with proper identification of these bushfire locations. Minister Darrell Vaz says this is a strategic and critical move given the extremely dry and hot conditions being experienced island-wide. He points out that the Jamaica Fire Brigade recently released figures suggesting that, along with the high temperatures, this summer is also seeing a record number of bushfires. It is also being revealed that the parish is recording the majority of these bushfires are St. Anne, St. Mary and St. Catherine, which happens to be the same parishes experiencing the most severe drought conditions at this time. Local Government and Community Development Minister Desmond McKenzie says focus will be placed on strengthening public education about bushfires as part of the natural disaster and emergency response mechanisms. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Water is precious. So we encourage everyone to practice the four R's of water conservation. Always remember to reduce your use of water wherever possible. Replace water wasting devices with water savings devices. Reuse water wherever possible. And wherever leaks are found, please repair them and repair them quickly. Don't delay. Practice the four R's of water conservation today. We're in a celebratory mood. After all, Jamaica officially reaches 57 years of political freedom tomorrow. What does this mean? Watch this. Independence memory for me was when I was about 10, 11 years old and I went to Grand Gala. And when I used to watch the parade going around and then go to the stadium and watch all the floats and stuff, that's what I can remember from when I was a little child. We just used to go a street and dance and never play, never pay no money. The music free and you just dance and enjoy yourself till you go home. Last year, independent, I go to the stadium and I enjoy myself. Me and my granddaughter and I enjoy myself a lot. We're coming from a long way. We have struggled as black people and this reminds us that we should remember those people who fought for us. In the 90s when I was a child, we used to like see the John Kuna guys in the main street, in the main town, and we used to like watch them. I went to Grand Gala and it was better than the rest of my Independence Day that's went because it was fun to see, you know, the whole festivities and thing, and it was Damian Marley who performed, so that was really good. 
and I spent it with my family there, and it was just like a good time. We continue to pay tribute to the fathers of this great nation that is Jamaica by remembering another of our heroes who also holds the distinction of being the island's first prime minister, Sir Alexander Bustamante. He was a commanding figure, a ruggedly handsome and a stylish gentleman who was very sure of himself. He was born William Alexander Clark in Blenheim, Hanover in 1884 at age 20, he did what was typical of many middle-class Jamaicans like himself, migrate to make a life abroad. For the next 30 years, his adventurous spirit took him to several countries, including Panama, the United States, and Cuba. And during his travels, he changed his name from William Alexander Clark to Alexander Bustamante. In Cuba, the seeds of what later became his lifelong passion were planted as he watched Cuban workers agitate for better working conditions. 1933, he was in Cuba. In fact, he left Cuba for Jamaica. And as you know, in Cuba, there were thousands of Jamaican workers in the Santiago Oriente um, region. And he would have seen the agitation in Cuba in 1933 as Cuban workers, in fact, were in rebellion in 1933. Upon his return home in 1934, at age 50, Bustamante set up his business in downtown Kingston. This brought him in daily contact with the war and misery of the Jamaican people. He goes into the money lending business, and who better to understand the condition the conditions that people suffer than someone who lends money. And this, I believe, must have um, developed in him the almost hobby of writing letters to the press commenting on the terrible conditions in, existing in Jamaica in 1938. He bombarded the Gleaner, the island's main newspaper, with letters about the plight of Jamaican workers. These letters were regarded as hostile and earned him some unsavory labels such as pest, communist, and usurper. Around September 1937, Bustamante seemed to have taken the decision to be the voice of change for the Jamaican worker. He took his campaign to the street corners and homes all over the island. From Westmoreland to Kingston, Bustamante drummed up support encouraging workers to protest for better working conditions. When the workers on the waterfront in May 1938 uh, went on strike, it's a completely spontaneous thing, said William Grant, an ex-Garveyite, actually approached Buster. and said, come and talk to these wharf workers. When he, when he went down to the wharf, the workers were a little bit unwilling to talk to him because Buster was a brown man or near white. But Grant actually persuaded them to listen. And this is how he actually got a toehold into the labor movement in Jamaica. He was affectionately called Buster or Chief, the champion in the struggle for workers' rights. Those whom he represented stretched from the sugar fields in the west to the docks of Kingston and to the banana fields in the east. And Jamaicans embraced him wholeheartedly. He had a common touch. And uh, he was very much easy and at home in some back room of some shop, eating saltfish and crackers and whatever, you know, having a drink and t elbowing with the people and talking very much at home. Not that he, uh, I mean, he was always the boss, you know, I mean, Buster, I mean, he wouldn't suffer, you know, any foolishness. But he rubbed shoulders easily with people. and. You see, man, he was a street man, street corner man too, you know. Loved to talk on the street corners, quite at home. 
Buster's determination to represent the workers made him a thorn in the side of the colonial authorities. His now famous battle cry, shoot me but let my people go, made him a hero in the eyes of those he represented. The workers' confidence in him translated into mass support for the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, which he formed in May 1938. In no time, it was a tremendous success. It was a, a blanket union which would have incorporated people of all occupations, laborers, artisans, um, uh, wherever. And um, they kept the fees fairly low for membership. And um, I think that, that helped. And it certainly became the up to 1948 or so, it was the largest trade union in Jamaica. The support also spilled over into the Jamaica Labour Party, which Buster formed in 1943 to compete in the 1944 election, the year of universal adult suffrage. The fact that he swept the elections, I think is part of an indication of the strength of the BITU and how well he himself was personally known uh, throughout the island. Buster's success in the election carried over to the next election and he won a second determined office in 1949. He became Jamaica's first chief minister and started the work to get Jamaica to become a part of the British West Indian Federation. Jamaica became a member in 1958 during the term of office of the other political party, the People's National Party. However, Buster later changed his mind about Jamaica being a part of the Federation as he felt that it would drain Jamaica's resources to help the other British territories. I think in principle a little bit reluctant to believe that the Federation had the resources to be viable because there are times they refer to the Federation of Paupers, we are all poor people. And I think he also projected the image of a federation in which Jamaica would be, Jamaica's resources would be drained to assist um, islands which are even poorer than us. So everybody would become poor. This was his, um, his kind of um, thing. But I don't think that the intention was ever to create antagonism between Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. Buster again took up the role of the defender of the Jamaican people who backed him when they voted by a referendum to withdraw Jamaica from the Federation and start Jamaica's move towards independence. His political first came again when the JLP won the 1962 election. At age 78, Buster Manti was named the first Prime Minister of an independent Jamaica. Two years later, due to illness, he left the political scene and in 1967 retired from public life. Buster Mantis detractors have almost suggested that he was um, very limited intellectually. But there's really not any evidence of that, you know. There is really no evidence to suggest that he was intellectually incompetent. What is true is that um, Norman Manley was acknowledged to be such a brilliant law um, practitioner in, in, in the law that he seemed light years ahead of Buster, but he's ahead of everybody else too. No, I don't think he was as limited as some um, people make out, and I think he was able to grasp important issues and to deal with them head on. The nation's highest honor, national hero, was conferred upon Alexander Bustamante in 1967. Here again, he created history, being the only person to have received this honor while still alive. We have often mocked the Jamaican people by saying that what they're looking for is a messiah. So what? Why shouldn't they look for a messiah? And what the word messiah really means to them was a champion, a bodyguard, a champion. And I think um, what the Jamaican people have always wanted is the kind of leadership, especially in the old days, that would be able to take them out of the gross difficulties under which they labored, lift them out of it, give them a vision and hope of where they ought to go. You can't abandon people and say, shift for yourself. You have to bring them together and give them that 
leadership and vision about themselves and their country. Buster Manti lived for 10 years after, basking in the rewards of his labor. Today, there are numerous monuments that honor his memory and the part he played in the history of this nation. Alexander Bustamante died on August 6, 1977, 15 years to the day that he stood proudly to witness his ultimate success for the Jamaican people, independence. Watch as we pay tribute to another nation builder. He's a national hero, served as Jamaica's premier, and founded a political party that is still active today. Find out more about Norman Washington Manley next. Washington Manley was born at Roxborough, Manchester on July 4th, 1893. He was a brilliant scholar, which meant that he did extremely well in school and later went on to be a lawyer. It was Norman Manley's expertise as an attorney in the criminal, civil and appeal courts that laid the foundation for what was to be his life's work in Jamaica's political development. It all started with his advocacy for the country's banana growers who wanted to establish a banana shipping company, but this was strongly opposed to by a foreign-based exporter in Jamaica. Still, that did not stop Manley from intervening, and in the end, the export company set aside one cent per sum of banana exported from Jamaica to form a fund called the Jamaica Welfare Limited. What do you think these facts say about the character of Mr. Manley? Means he was not only concerned about the farmers or the poor, but he was also dedicated to helping them. That's true. And in 1938, when a series of industrial actions broke out, you know, workers went on strike, Norman's cousin, Alexander Bustamante, who is another one of our national heroes, and who is also a strong defender of the poor working class people, was arrested. And guess what? Alexander Bustamante asked Norman Manley to represent the striking workers who were determined that they would not return to work until Bustamante was released. Norman's response would forever change the course of his life. In that night I made up my mind and I put an advertisement in the leading newspaper of Jamaica that I would represent all the striking groups in the country. His ability to negotiate the cause of the poor resulted in Bustamante being released and the workers' few recalmed, at least for a while. By this time, Norman Manley had reached a turning point in his political career. And was then I realized that the time had come to make a new political move. We had had 300 years of British rule without self-government. And it looked as if it was about time we started to take an interest in our own affairs. Miss, what he meant by new political movement? Was he going to stop looking out for those workers? No, 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 no. He still cared for the people, but he wanted more for them. Remember in 1938 when he formed the People's National Party? Yes, Miss! But the people, especially the poor working class, were not allowed to vote. So he set out on a mission to change that. Norman Manley was deeply involved in the fight for a new constitution for Jamaica and was among those who helped to bring the country to full adult suffrage in 1944 from a reluctant British colonial rule. Manley strove for self-government in a climate that was largely hostile to the idea and after Jamaica withdrew from the Federation of the West Indies, he set up a joint committee to decide on a constitution for separate independence for Jamaica. With great distinction, Manley led the team that negotiated Jamaica's independence from Britain. 
Throughout his political career, Norman Manley was elected chief minister after the 1955 election and later as premier in 1958. Are you enjoying the story so far, guys? Yes, please. Miss, what can you tell us about his personal life? He was married with children, one of whom is Michael Manley, and he later became the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Although Norman Manley led a busy life, that did not prevent him from finding the love of his life. And sometime between taking up his Rhodes Scholarship to the Oxford University in England and enlisting in the British Army during the First World War, he met and fell in love with Edna Swithenbank. She was an artist and sculptress. And in addition to Michael, the two had another son, Douglas, who also served as a government minister. While helping to create a multi-party system in Jamaica, Norman Manley made the needs of the people the focus of the government. After giving exemplary service to his country, Norman Washington Manley retired from politics in July of 1969. He died in September of that same year at the age of 76, and thereafter was declared a national hero. Well, students, that's all the time we have today to talk about our national hero, Norman Manley. Sadly, we have come to the end of our class, but I have some pictures I would love to share with you. President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya is on the island for a three-day visit that's expected to bring Jamaica and the African country closer together. In addition to participating in Jamaica 57 Grand Degala activities, he's also expected to attend the Denby Agricultural, Industrial and Food Show. President Kenyatta and Prime Minister Andrew Holness will also continue talks started on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly and the G7 Summit in Canada last year. At those meetings, the two discussed possible code share for airlines, trading coffee and peanut, as well as speaking with one voice within the African, Caribbean and Pacific group of countries. Discussions also focused on increasing exchanges in culture, entertainment and tourism. A possible agreement was also explored to share information between athletics coaches. So you see, possibilities for future collaboration and partnership are endless. Jamaica is on the move, leveraging our brand to bring economic growth and job creation, all in a bid to provide hope for our people. And that's our show. Be sure to join us again tomorrow right here on the station for the independence messages of our Governor General, Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. You may find other interesting items on jis.gov.jm or on our social media pages. There's also our mobile app that's Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire team at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.